meet the king of the Illinois River. Wow. Wow. And a big show off. Muscular. Very muscular. I mean, this thing will hurt you. Yes, yes. They can jump out of the water at high speeds. Uh, they can jump a great distance out of the water, up to eight feet out of the water. Fast, easy to startle, and voracious eaters, Asian silver carp are a jarring sight here, and a hit on YouTube. But Greg Sass, until recently with the Illinois Natural History Survey, says that in the long history of this waterway, what's also remarkable is when this fish got here, just 20 years ago. By the mid-2000s, it was becoming a crisis, um, not only with fish jumping everywhere, but just what was showing up in our catches, the amount of Asian carp versus the native fishes. It's just amazing how wide it is. Yes. With no natural predators in this stretch of the river in central Illinois, up to nine out of ten fish here are now Asian carp. We've seen explosive population growth. We've seen uh, a population that has doubled almost every year since 2000 here. Uh, we're fairly confident we have the highest wild densities of Asian carp anywhere in the world. Which is quite a feat, considering this fish is from China. The Illinois River has been invaded. These fish are behaving in a way that we're not used to. They're doing things to the ecosystem that we're not completely sure what kind of effect there's going to be yet. And there's just an incredible abundance of them. It's an invasion from coast to coast, from Africanized killer honeybees in the southwest to South American nutria in Louisiana, to the spread of the Burmese python in the Florida Everglades, all part of a scary trend. Everywhere we look, we see species that are spreading and damaging our, our natural ecosystems now and when scientists look into the future, they see the potential for many more damaging species. You make it sound like we're under attack everywhere. We are under attack everywhere. David Lodge is a biologist at the University of Notre Dame. He says our agricultural system depends on plant and animal species imported to America, like wheat and cows and pigs. But that doesn't make them invaders. An invasive species is a species that's been transported from one part of the planet to the other by people and a species that has a harmful impact. And typically transported by design, by accident, a little bit of both? Both. Lots of uh, invasive species have been transported by accident in the ballast water of ships or as a, a hidden pest on plants that have been imported. Uh, but many have also been imported intentionally. Like the Shakespeare fan who, back in the 1890s, set out to bring to America every bird mentioned in the Bard's plays. I think we can be grateful that he was unsuccessful for a great many of those birds, but he was amazingly successful with starlings. And how did that are, work with, out? I mean, starlings are now one of the most common birds in North America, and a nuisance. Today, they number more than 200 million. Most species were introduced for practical reasons, like the Asian carp, which was imported to clean catfish ponds in Arkansas. But, as is almost always the case, um, they escaped. And it wasn't really until perhaps the 1980s that biologists in the Mississippi Basin realized this was a growing problem that was likely to get very severe. Asian carp migrated up the Mississippi River to its tributaries, the Missouri and Illinois. Today, only a series of electric barriers in Chicago's shipping channels separate the fish from the Great Lakes and its $7 billion commercial and recreational fishing industry. Now consider kudzu, nicknamed the vine that ate the south. As you can see, it's taken over the vegetation that was here. It's overtopping the small trees. It's overtopping the taller trees, and it will eventually shade them out. The trees will die, and it'll all come down to the ground, and everything that's here will be kudzu. There won't be anything living in here except for kudzu. Back in the 30s, the U.S. government paid farmers to plant this Japanese vine to control erosion. And the kudzu began to... Uh, exemplify the theory of unintended consequences very well. Uh, it got everywhere that it wasn't supposed to get. John Taylor of the U.S. Forest Service says kudzu, which can grow as fast as a foot a day, now covers up to eight million acres of the South. 
snapping power lines, and blanketing trees and even structures like this barn in rural Georgia. And it will eventually cover the whole building. Well, look at this. And pull it down. And you're getting kudzu bugs all over everybody. Itself an invasive species, popularly known in this region as the stink bug. These little fellows like to overwinter in dwellings. And they create uh, quite a furor when people are not used to having hundreds of thousands of these little critters invade their house. And when they're disturbed, they, their defensive response is a very offensive odor. So you might go sweep them out, but you'll get a surprise in the process. Taylor says scientists do know how to eradicate kudzu. The problem is spending the money that it would take to control large areas and the time that it would take over multiple years to control kudzu. It's just, it's not a feasible activity. The bill would run into the billions, which brings us to the national tab for invasive species. Notre Dame's David Lodge. The cost to the U.S. economy from invasive species generally are on the order of at least $120 billion annually. Costs like the $10 billion that cities will spend over the next 10 years to treat or replace the millions of ash trees caught in the path of the emerald ash borer, a bug that likely found its way from China on wooden shipping pallets. Or the tens of millions of dollars spent clearing pipes and harbors covered in trillions of zebra and quagga mussels brought to the Great Lakes on ships from Europe. As the world grows more interconnected, Lodge says the problem will only grow worse. There's just more opportunity now to move species intentionally and unintentionally around the globe. Few parts of the country have more experience with that than South Florida. You got a lot of trade, a lot of international tourism, a lot of uh, international cargo, and, uh, and you have a climate where whatever gets here lives forever. Adam Putnam is Florida's agriculture commissioner. He says that in recent years his state has endured infestations that range from the exotic, like Burmese pythons and Gambian pouched rats, to vital threats to agriculture, like the Mediterranean fruit fly. On his radar now, the giant African land snail, which can lay 1,200 eggs a year. It was like a dream or something. It was like a mythic creature that walked across. It was about that big. And they're really slithery and juicy, and they have all kinds of fluids coming out. I, I don't like it. I, you know, for me, it's like, this is disgusting. With something like snails, we've got the trifecta. It carries human meningitis, so people are concerned. It eats 500 different plants, so agriculture is concerned. And it eats houses, so homeowners are very concerned. This stucco-eating pest that can grow up to eight inches long has brought together a team of 70 people, including representatives from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Nationally, 30 federal agencies are involved in the fight against invasive species, with about $1.5 billion spent annually. Federal or state, funding is a struggle. It's difficult. Uh, uh, screenings at the airport and seaport face other pressures, pressures to look for drugs, to look for um, bombs, to look for other weapons of mass destruction. So post 9-11, you, you see less of a focus on, on snails and citrus canker and laurel wilt disease and things like that. Unsuspecting travelers bring in pests and diseases daily. One solution for Florida, educating the public. Wherever you're coming from, leave all that stuff behind because any one of those things can carry the larva that's going to become the fly that's going to wipe out a uh, hundred billion dollar industry in our state. Prevention is key, David Lodge argues, but also our biggest challenge. For the most part, um, in the United States, we continue to operate under um, what I would describe as an open door policy. With very few exceptions, it is legal to import alive into the United States almost any plant or animal that exists on the planet. And there are at least 1.7 million species on the planet. So when it comes to invasive species, as we say in the reporting business, this is a story with legs.